I suppose I've buried the lead because Scott Boris will be in the news this winter because most likely he'll be negotiating a contract for A-Rod. Within 10 days of the end of the World Series, he has to either opt out or stay with the Yankees. Did you get any sense from your time with Boris of which way A-Rod will go? It's presumed that he will opt out. I think Boris would really like to ha for Alex to opt out because he like his he prefers an open market. He likes to create a bidding process and, and to really, you know, that, that's, the, that's the position that puts him in the most control of, of all the information, you know, the, where the teams are all playing against one another in the dark and Boris is the one who's in control of things. The wild card is, is the situation with the Yankees, which is just chaos now with the, with the Steinbrenner sons taking over and, the, and Joe Torre leaving. As of a few weeks ago, Brian Cashman who's the Yankees general manager, was being very uh, certain about the fact that the Yankees were not going to negotiate with, with A-Rod or with Boris if he did opt out. They, they enjoy this subsidy from the Texas Rangers right now uh, that makes it a, a pretty good bargain to have A-Rod on the team. So did you get a sense, I'm guessing you didn't, but whether Boris even believed that position from the Yankees? The Yankees were, I think, trying to follow a a new approach of kind of playing hardball back against Boris. The, the conventional wisdom that I got from a lot of inside baseball people, this, again this was before things started to really crumble in the Yankee world, uh, was that that in this game of chicken what would happen is that is that Boris would end up getting a really long nego extension for Rodriguez but the Yankees would would buckle in the end and give him an extension and he would not opt out. I think now it's, it's anyone's guess with what the Steinbrenners, you know, Hank and Hal Steinbrenner have, have said they're going to meet personally with Scott Boris, uh, which is something that as of a week ago wouldn't have been, uh, wasn't on the table. Is there any sense that there's a, a Boris progression? It almost seems like there's a bubble, and whether it's with A-Rod or not, that maybe that bubble has to burst or maybe not. Maybe Boris is right, as he describes in your piece, that um, the game is growing, and it's growing on both sides, and it's just a natural response to that growth that players are making more and the best players are making a lot more. I think probably he's right about that. Uh, I know that there are, if you look historically, people have said after every one of these big deals that has been negotiated, and many of them have been negotiated by Boris, people have snickered and laughed and said, God, you're never going to, you're never going to see that again. Certainly that was said ap the day after Alex Rodriguez signed his current deal, which he's now threatening to opt out of. I don't think anyone in, in 2000 thought that that he was actually going to exercise that clause and say, no, I'm, I'm ready for a new contract, this one isn't good enough. I know. The same, the same would be true of, of, I think, Kevin Brown's contract. When Kevin Brown got a contract, um, I guess it was with the Dodgers. Yeah, I think. That big deal. People, it was the biggest pitching contract ever. I, I, Kevin Brown, again, may not have, have lived up to that contract in some people's eyes, but pitchers have continued to make more. Barry Zito just last year signed an even bigger contract than Kevin Brown had. Zito also didn't have a particularly good year this year, but the contracts keep coming. Yeah, I mean, people were saying that when Cal Ripken signed a $7 million a year deal, it, it never seems to stop. Right. Well, and that get back, gets back to this point about the, the question about what baseball players deserve as, a, as opposed to uh, how much money the industry is making. I, it reminds me of one of the things that Faye Vincent, the, the former baseball commissioner, told me. Uh, while, on the one hand, sort of seeming aghast at, at, at the money that Boris was, was talking about uh, asking for someone like A-Rod. He then paused and said, there are people in, uh, in Connecticut who work at hedge funds, live not far from me, who are making $30 million a year for having a bad year. This isn't something that we, that, that we seem to question as much in other industries, necessarily. Yeah. Well, we don't hear about it as much. It's not on the front page of the business section. Well, sometimes it is, but not as often as it's on the front page of the sports section when someone signs a big contract. Right. Boris says he doesn't like to, like Jerry Maguire style, hang out with his players. Was, did he seem like a good guy to hang out with? In the piece, he seems like kind of a real serious, this is what he does, and there's not a lot much more to him. He doesn't take vacations. I'm not sure he'd be the, the most fun guy in the world to hang out with. He's, he's a kind of... Uh charming, charmingly cocky guy, uh, but he likes to talk and what he likes to do is to almost lecture about the way things work and I, th and I think he likes to have people around him who, who want to listen and look up to him. I think the, the players that he has the best relationships with are, are the players 
who are apt to sit there and listen to him and, and uh, take his advice. He, he, he obviously does well by most of them. And, yeah. and I think his employees, you know, he goes to the ballpark with, with a lot of his guys who um, are former players themselves. And I think he, he, I think he relaxes a little bit more there. He's more of a teasing relationship with them. Didactic, you describe him as in the piece. Could, could a wave come and he wouldn't see it? Is he too smart a guy to miss a sea change? Or is he so zeroed in on his view of the world that he could miss it? No, I think he's. I think he's constantly on the lookout for for anything that he can use uh, to his advantage, uh, and and so if he's. I think he's pretty well aware of what's going on. Uh, I don't. I wouldn't say he's didactic in in a kind of tunnel vision sense. He's didactic in in the sense that he is very sure of himself. Uh, once he's scanned the horizon. Uh, at least for the for, for the given day, he'll be sure that the wave isn't coming, and he'll tell you about it. Uh, all the reasons why it's not coming.